respond to this? How about you love me too? Billy Crystal is here. He is a comedian, actor, director, author, and nine-time Oscar host. His new memoir looks back on some of the highlights of a life and career. It is called Still Fooling Them, Where I've Been, Where I'm Going, and Where the Hell Are My Keys. He's also bringing back his Tony Award-winning play, 700 Sundays, this fall. I am pleased to have him here at this table for the first time. Welcome. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Oh, it's great to be here. Uh, why write this? Um... I approached the 65th birthday with a lot of trepidation. This one got to me. Yeah. This one got to me. Um, because? It's a big number. 50 was big, yeah. 40 was, you know, but they all became something. Yeah. My 40s became City Slickers. Uh, my 50s became Seven Inches Sundays. Right. Um, and when I became a grandfather, became Parental Guidance, the movie yeah. with Bat. This one is a little, you know, because I, I got my Social Security stuff and I yeah, got yeah. my Medicare stuff yeah. and it all got too real, so I thought... This is when society says you're supposed to retire. Exactly. And I just feel like I'm really just getting going. Yeah. And uh, I thought I'd go out on the road and do stand-up, which I hadn't done in a long time. My road stuff has been seven or Sundays on the road. Mm. And I started writing stuff that I thought was really funny about what gravity was doing to my body. Yeah. And uh, it felt it's not funny. Kind. It's not no, kind, is no, it? <laughs> no. And it became, they became more like essays. Yeah. And that became the book. And, and did it bring back memories? What does it do to write and think and go back and share things that you might have forgotten about? Well, you know what's a great thing, Charlie? It gave me a discipline that I didn't have before as far as writing. When I'd work on a script as a producer or as a writer, I'd be in a room with other people. Yeah. This was getting to the computer every day for a set amount of time. Whatever happened, happened. If I had something great, if I didn't, I wouldn't go. And I really loved it. And it brought back so many stories and so many memories that when it was done, I felt like, okay, I've had a really good life. And that's, and that's what the book's about. Michael Caine told me when he wrote his first, he had a two-part memoir. He said, you remember things you don't think you remember or that you've forgotten. And you'll start in, and then all of a sudden you read more and you remember more and you remember more. Yeah, but then when it's done and they, and they print it, you go, oh, I forgot that. <laughs> so, so that happens also. Uh, Long Beach. Mm-hmm place you love and you've done a lot for you've paid homage to to what it's meant to you yes my hometown yeah um we're both from small towns right um yours is considerably smaller <laughs> yes, than, is. than mine <laughs> and, and um, not close to new york city either yeah no we were about uh, ten thousand people in the winter and four or five million in the summer <laughs> uh it's a little beach town that got beaten up badly Bad by sandy by yeah. sandy and uh, janice and i are trying to help uh, get it back up on its uh on its feet and who is this janice you're talking about Janice is my wife of 43 years. Our first day, Charlie, was during the Johnson administration. Yes. I was 18 years old when I saw her. I said to my friend, I'm going to marry her. Oh, I don't I believe that for a second. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, how do you know that? I mean, whenever I hear those stories, I'm like, hey, come on, hit this. Listen, I also said that about Sophia Loren. <laughs> yes, I, so, I and Julia. I mean, Proust did you say about this? Of just yeah. the one. No, I just, it was just a thing. I just saw her. And yeah, I, went, I just went, that's it. Yeah. And then, you know, I was away. So you uh, chased her. Was it on the beach? Was it? Yeah. Or, yeah. You, I you went after her and we just started yeah. talking. And yeah. we, were both, we were both counselors in a day camp and just started yeah. dating. And that was it. I, I didn't go back to college because of her. No, but you changed colleges, didn't yeah, you? I, yeah. yeah. I went, I, I went you from... Because you believed if you went back to where you had been going to college. Was it Marshall? Yeah. I went yeah. to Marshall versus... And, yeah. and, and, and you came uh, back and went to a community college. Yes. Where I really found myself, too, besides finding her... Yeah. NASA Community College got me into the theater department, and that I don't think I've stopped working since I was there. It takes a teacher, it takes a program, it takes somebody to, to, that you just latch on to, yeah. and it was there. Um, two guys, and one named Wes Jens, the other Sid Lee, who were acting teacher and the head of the department, and they, I started directing right away. I started acting right away. We did musicals. We built our own theater on a... It was a fascinating place. It was yeah. a, an old Air Force base. So they had these airplane hangars. Yeah. And um, the, the theater department made it a theater, an indoor-outdoor theater. So we would have 3,000 people on a summer night watching musicals on a runway of an yeah. old Air Force base. So that was the place that uh, I think really got me going. And from there I went to NYU and studied film with Martin Scorsese. He was my graduate film professor. And How was he? An intense young guy. <laughs> you know, it was 1968, 9, and 70. Charlie, he had a beard yeah. like here, granny yeah. glasses, yeah. hair to his shoulders. Who else looked like that in 68? <laughs> Everybody. 
But he was so brilliant and so intense. He was making his first movie. Right. Mean Streets? Uh, no, this was a, a movie called Who's That Knocking on My Door? Oh. A tiny little uh, first independent movie. But he was so inspiring. Um, mm. Every time I see him, I say the same thing to him. Why would you give me a C? Yeah. <laughs> but he was... Uh, and what does he say? You deserve to see Yeah. Well, you know, it was out of focus. <laughs> Everything he did was out of focus. I don't understand, but you know, he talks very quickly. He says, sorry, he does. He does. Uh, but your dad, your parents encouraged you to do whatever you wanted to do. Oh, yeah. I mean, they say, you want to be a stand-up comedian? Well, my dad, you know... Uh, Tell jokes. My dad, who I lost when I was 15, um, really set me on my way yeah. um, by showing me that it was okay to stay up late during the week so I could watch Ernie Kovacs. It was okay to stay up late to watch Jack Parr yeah. only when Jonathan Winters was on. Yeah. And it was the 50s because look at the comedians who were on television. It was Sid Caesar and, and Phil Silvers and, yeah. and uh, Gleason and Carney. And every Sunday night, uh, Ed Sullivan would have a great different kind of stand-up comedian. Yeah. And it was usually Alan King. You know, it was <laughs> yes, every week, it was Alan King. Uh, but it, it, that was a time to learn. And then Dad brought home these comedy albums yeah. uh, from the record store that was yeah. the family He had business. a big Commodore record store. It was his, yes, wasn't it? Yeah, 40 and, Seconds Street Between Lexington. And, and had that jazz la label he yeah, created. But, yeah. but he would come home and bring you comedy albums and say... And then you'd listen. Yeah. And you'd listen to the masters. And you'd hear the timing. And you start to develop your own timing. But you'd understand what Nichols and May were doing live on Broadway. You'd understand what Jonathan Winters was like in concert. You'd, you'd get a feel. And then the 2,000-year-old man became my Bible. So mm, yeah. that was a great way to understand how electric it is to be in front of a live audience. It came audience. your Bible because you listened to those two. Those two. Carl and Mike and said, wow. Uh, yeah, and Mel. And, and Mel. Mel. I'm sorry, yeah. not Mike. No. Well, uh, they originally yeah. were Carl and Mike. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and they broke up. That, Mike was with Elaine. Yes. You know. And, and you know, now that, uh, you know, I've been working for a while, I, yeah. they're very good friends of mine. And it really yeah. freaks me out that I know Carl and Mel very well. Because they shaped you <clears> when you were a kid, listening to them, saying, I want to do this, can I do this? Yes, and, and it was, you learned two things from them. One, you learned how to just go, because no one goes like Mel. And then you also learned how to be unselfish, like Carl, and listen and feed. So yeah. it's the greatest straight man and the greatest funny man, perhaps, yeah. that ever lived. You have, I saw this, I think, in a conversation we had with John Stewart. <clears throat> Failure is an important thing for a comedian to understand. Yeah. Meaning? I think you have to be willing to bomb. You have to go out on the edge and say, this may not work, you know, and be bold. Don't work safe because then you're not exploring every yeah. second on there. And if you, and even if you do bomb, and we all do, something good will come out of that. Some little notion, some little thought. You'll get something that will make it better next you'll time. You'll fix it next time. And that was the best advice I've ever been given. And um, it was by a brilliant man. He's 96 years old now. His name is Jack Rollins. Oh, yeah, I know who he is. Yeah. And um, he was Woody's manager, Nichols yeah, and May. Yeah. Um, and I was one of his puppy comedians uh, at the puppy office. Puppy comedians? Well, we were the new, yeah. and, and, you know, right, I was like a right. new guy. And they, at that point, they had Dick Cavett and, and, right. and Robert Woody, Klein. Right, right. And, and Woody, of course, and um, Tom Poston, who was really funny. And um, Jack was the dean. Yeah. And the uh, man who worked under him, uh, Buddy Morrow, was my everyday guy. And I was starting to do pretty well. I had like a really good 20 you know, minutes. Comedy clubs around. Yeah, Catch a Rising Star in New York and, and uh, The Improv. And I had this, and Jack was coming to see me. Yeah. Now, Jack looked like an eclectic Brooklyn College English <laughs> yes, professor yes, yes. with tons of dandruff <laughs> on his <laughs> shoulders. It looked like they were epaulets, you know. <laughs> like like he, was he was a, a Navy admiral. <laughs> yes. yes. And, um, and always a little butt of a cigar in his mouth. Yeah. And Duke Ellington's eyes, he had these very sad yeah. eyes. And I was... I really hit this 20 minutes good. I was really strong. Yeah. Crowd wanting more, left great. Jack and I go out afterwards. First time I'm going to be with this man, and I'm thinking he's going to say to me, I'm giving up Woody. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> yes. And You're I was, that good, I, Yes, I was feeling very cocky. He was a really strong... Because you get this, this afterglow from a good, a good 20 oh, minutes, yeah. man. It's great. Oh, yeah. And Jack looks at me and says, how would you feel it went tonight? I said, well, I thought it was great. The audience loved it. He said... I didn't like it. And now I'm ready to stab him. And I go, why? And he goes, it was very effective. Yeah. But you never told me how you feel about something. You never use the word I in a sentence. I know what Muhammad Ali thinks, because I was imitating him. Yeah. I know what this is. I know what that is. They're wonderful toys and games. And you could do very well with just this 20 minutes for a while. But you work too safe. And yeah. you didn't leave a tip. And yeah. I go, what, what do you mean? The tip, it's a little extra something you leave on the table, 
um, you know, f to, to the audience will take that with them. They'll know who you are. You know, right? What you did was very good Chinese food. Because yeah. you, know, you don't remember what you <laughs> ate 30 minutes later. You're full, but you don't know what you ate. And he said, leave a tip. Yeah. Be prepared to bomb. Come in tomorrow. So what became a tip? Be personal. Talk about what you know. He said, listen, you're a, you're a husband and father. You have an 18-month-old baby. Talk about that. No one else does that on stage. They're not. All of these guys don't have anybody like that. Talk about that. Talk about that. And he, and he said, come in tomorrow. Don't do any of this stuff. It'll be rocky, but something good will come out of it. Just be prepared. To and how long did it take you? Um, it took about a couple of weeks till I started to understand it. You know, the first, the next night, I, I understood it. I did bomb, but it was yeah. something good about it, and it was something more casual. And then one night, at the uh, the bitter end downtown, uh, it was then called the other end. Yeah, I'm on stage. Things are starting to go pretty well, and I see a silhouette of somebody in the doorway, and I went, "Oh man, it's Bill Cosby." That was my hero then. Yeah, I mean, because. Cosby was the guy, and he was so relatable, you know, on, on the records, on those records. He, you know, I, I, he had brothers, I had brothers. He played football at Temple. I belonged to a Temple. So, you know, there was, <laughs> yes, so, yes. I'm working the All act those in Charlie. Yes, and right. then, so then he came backstage and introduced himself. This was like my, you know, this was like meeting Mickey Mantle. This was Cosby at his height. Yeah. And we went next door, and he started talking. And he, and he said an interesting thing, very akin to what Jack told me. Don't let him... Don't let them catch. Uh, don't let them catch you working. Yeah. Don't let them see you working. Just talk. It'll all come out. And then it's, it's taken a long time for that to happen. But you know, uh, yeah. that I've taken that advice very well. Bill Cosby told me that one of the important moments <clears throat> in his own development was he came over from Philadelphia and he went to see Jonathan Winters, and Winters had a bad night. Mm. And he knew I can fail and still be. Look at Jonathan Winters. Yeah. You know, it happens. We all have bad nights. Yeah. You know, you just want to have a bad night in front of a million. A lot people. of comedians love him, don't they, Bill Cosby? Yes, because of what he talks about. Yes, because it's all real and it's yeah. effortless and it's um, it's just natural. It's just like you feel like he's a friend and has been for forty years. Yeah. How much of this is learned, and how much of it is the instinctive way you are as a human being? I, I don't know how to say percentages. Yeah, but, but I mean, just a feeling of it. It has to be both. Yes. Yeah, I have to. Yeah, I mean, could you look, talk to Steve Martin and a lot of people, I mean, they work hard at making these acts come up. You know, I mean, some people will say there's nothing, there's nothing. It's just you. Yeah. You've got no band. Right. You've got no support. You've got no vocalist. You've got nothing but you standing up there with people saying, be funny. Yeah. Be it's funny. A, it's a tough job. <laughs> some people say, it's a, oh, I can't imagine. That's the toughest job ever. And I go, well, try boxing. <laughs> yes, that's tough, too. Yes. Uh, Saturday Night Live was a big breaking point for you. The yes. Big... Yeah, when I came back to it yeah. uh, well, in 1984. When, first, when first? Yes, I was part of the, I was going to be a guest on the first show and yeah. got bumped. Uh, and then uh, What came was back. it they didn't like? It wasn't that they didn't like anything. It, it was just... Everything was good. It was too long. Oh, yeah. And I was so new, I didn't have anything. When Lauren Michaels came over to me and said, listen, I need two minutes. I'm two minutes out of what I did. He said, "No, I need two minutes." Oh, yeah. I didn't have anything else. Yeah. And then all the b managers come in, and there's you know, there's arguments and whatever happened. And I'm waiting in the hallway and to do the show. And they said, "Come on, so it's not happening." And that was that was hard because uh, when I met Lauren at Catch Rising Star, I knew right away this is a brilliant young guy, yeah. and his vision for the show was so specific and great. It was basically at you know. At 11:30, programming stops, and these young, brilliant people are taking over the uh, yeah, taking over the right. network. <laughs> and I knew all. They of have them. a different idea than the establishment. Yeah, and and the guests on the first show were Andy Kaufman, oh yeah, who did Mighty Mouse on the first show, with me and a comedian named Valerie Bromfield. George Carlin was the host. Um, two musical acts, uh, Billy Press and Janice Ian. But I knew that I was involved with something fantastic, and there was a big lead up to that show with me and 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 everybody uh, on the staff there. And then it didn't happen, and I was I was really crushed. But Lauren had me back the next year, and then in 1984, Dick Ebersole was now the producer. Yeah. I hosted it twice, and he said to me, "Would you think about coming for a season with us if I can get Christopher Guest and Marty Short to come?" And I went, "Yes." Yes. <laughs> and it really turned everything around. It was one of the best years I've ever had yeah, in my career. That's when the whole character came. Yeah. You look marvelous. Fernando came very much at the table like this. <laughs> this golden yeah. oak is going to come back, I swear. <laughs> I 
That's right, John. <laughs> John Baez should be sitting here. And, <laughs> That's true. And, uh, and uh, all the different characters and working with Chris yeah. Guest and Marty and, and doing making these fun films. And I even hosted one during mm. the season. Uh, and that led to the movies. What's great about your life is the relationships <clears throat> you've had with remarkable people. Uh, Muhammad Ali. I mean, he called you a little brother. He still does. Yeah. Uh, I saw him in March. Uh, that was my first television experience ever for uh, a really great friend of, I'm sure you also, Dick right. Schapp, right. who was an incredible yeah, yeah. guy, uh, very, very badly missed. Um, Muhammad had just beaten George Foreman in Africa yeah. and was now Sport Magazine's Man of the Year. Dick was the editor of Sport Magazine right. at the time. And so they had um, this uh, local special, it was only seen in three states, um, honoring Muhammad Ali. And he called looking for Robert Klein, and our, our mutual agent said, well, Bob's out of town, but I got this young guy, and he does this really good imitation of Kosell and Ali. Yeah. And Dick said, well, tell him Friday night, 8 o'clock, <laughs> Plaza Hotel. <laughs> and I came, and there's every great sports person that oh, you yeah. can imagine, from their individual sports. Right. Um, and they're all on the dais. There's Gina Marchetti from the Baltimore right. Colts. Archie Griffin had just won the Heisman. Yeah, yeah. And to top it all off, Charlie, there's Neil Simon and George Plimpton. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. And then there's little me, and Ali's looking at me going, what is Joe Gray doing here? <laughs> yes, <that's laughs> and, and Dick said, well, how should I introduce you? I hadn't been on anything. Yeah. Nothing. And I said, well, just say I'm one of his oldest and dearest friends. <laughs> and the thought was, I'll get right to the microphone. Yeah. I won't have to talk. I'll go right into Cosell, yeah. and then Ali. And, and it, it just worked out really him. great. And um, when I finished, and no one had done him yet, and here's this little white Jewish guy doing the greatest guy, you know, greatest yeah, of all time. Yeah. And uh, I started getting heckled by Bundini. Do you remember Bundini? Oh, sure. Drew, Drew Bundini. Bundini. Yeah, he was a side man. And I'm, and I'm doing uh, Muhammad. And then I'm, hey, what's Bundini saying? He's saying like... I said, everybody's talking about Joe Fraser. I'm talking about Joe Fraser. <laughs> and I hear this, you got him. You got him, man. You got him. <laughs> And I go, what? what? Who is My this? My first intelligence getting no. heckled. And I looked at it, it was Bundini. And then I had to switch to Cosell to say, sit down, sit down, Drew. We know your story. We've seen you. This is about Muhammad. And I just handled it. And then after, when I finished, he said, you're my little brother. Yeah. And that's we've been like that um, for a long time now. You still see him? I do see him. Yeah. And How uh, is he? Uh, he's, he's better than people may yeah. think. Because of the speech. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, he helped me raise a million dollars for my hometown for Long yeah. Beach and Sandy Relief at a, a big by an appearance uh, by. There's an, an organization called Fight Night. Yeah, and it's in Phoenix every March, and this amazing man named Jimmy Walker puts this together, and they raise money for Parkinson's research. Charlie, I've never seen a. This is not Jimmy Walker, the comedian. No, yeah. no, um, I, I've never seen an evening with as many sports and entertainment people mingled together and the money that is raised in Phoenix is unbelievable and Ali is there of course and when they saw he and his wife Lonnie who's a phenomenal person saw the damage to Long Beach on CNN and all the coverage um, she called me and she said his wife is, called. is that your, that's your hometown isn't it yeah. and I went yeah and she and she said how can we help I said, well, I'm coming to fight night. What can we do? Can... She said, I will pledge to you. I've already talked to Muhammad. We will raise money that night, and we will give a portion of what we raise to Long Beach Relief. And they took it away from their own Parkinson's Research Relief to yeah. help my hometown. That is, that is, you know, when it's not a, a Sammy Davis Jr. kind of thing saying, he's a friend of mine, <laughs> but look what he did for me. Oh, I sat behind him at an NBA All-Star game. No, I sat in front of him. You know, and, and I just knew him slightly. And he tapped me on the shoulder and gave me some popcorn, in a, you know. And so I said thank you and took a handful and handed it back to him. You know, like three minutes later. You know, he was sharing his popcorn. Yeah, yeah. I, w I go to see him. This was about five, six years ago. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, he's staying at a hotel. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's staying at a hotel in L.A. Yeah. And I come into the room, and uh, we're talking, and then um, he falls asleep. Yeah. And Lonnie, his wife, says, calls me over, be closer, and she whispers to me, he's, uh, he's not sleeping at night, and he's been having nightmares about his fights. He thinks he's in a fight, and he'll start throwing punches, and I have to leave the room, so he's very exhausted. So that's why he's sleeping now. 
and I'm sitting next to him like this, and suddenly he starts hitting me in the back of the head. And they said, look out, it's Joe Buckner. Let's look out, Joe Fraser. Joe Fraser. Duh, duh, duh. It was all a joke. And then yeah. he laughs. Now he's got me. And then Howard Bingham comes in and takes pictures yeah, of you. Yeah, the pa- photographer's so always with him. He got all these right, pictures right, of me right, laughing. Right, 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 right. It was phenomenal. It, it's great. He actually did that with Ed Bradley in oh, a 60 Minutes piece. Same oh, thing. He did same. And Ed was surprised, totally oh, surprised so I was when shocked. it happened. Like, I was shocked. You know, and didn't realize that the joke was on him. Yeah. yeah. Mickey Mantle, mm-hmm. your boyhood hero, yeah. other than comedy. Yeah. Um... Amazing that I got to know him. Yeah. Uh, uh, from the first time I saw him, I was eight years old. Yeah. He signed a program uh, in the clubhouse that came out for us. My dad took us to the game, and it was sort of kismet. Joe. We had Louis Armstrong seats, yeah. and right. this program comes out, and I kept it all these years. I meet him. He signs the same program for me uh, yeah. 20-something years later, and then we became, like with Muhammad, we, it stuck, and we became yeah. friends, and it was... Sometimes you shouldn't meet heroes, you mm-hmm. know, but because you're going to find a part of them that's not as attractive as it may be, you know, you yeah. may want. Yeah. And um, I was with him many times where I know what you mean. The, the drinking was bad. Yeah, and, right. and, and then and, when and, the drinking becomes the abusiveness. And, and sadness yeah. and regrets. And it was really interesting. I was doing a special for NBC. I was hosting a special at, at Cooperstown. And Mickey was a guest. Yeah. He had not been in the Hall of Fame to see his plaque. When he got inducted, he left because he said to me, I, I, you know, I was never good enough. I should have been better. I never was good enough. I, I don't... So I walked him to his plaque with another writer named David Israel. Oh, yeah, I know, David. And we showed him where his plaque was. This is, you know... So the next, the next night... And what did he say when he saw the plaque? Why am I here? I should, I should be with Willie. How can, now he's complaining <laughs> about where he is, this man who didn't want to go in there. Yes. And <clears throat> we had this talk late at night. He, he couldn't sleep, and, and he'd been drinking all night, and we were supposed to be up the next morning to continue shooting. Yeah. And he was all upset about this stuff. And I said, what is it? And he goes, I, f- I, o- I always felt I failed my dad. And, you know, his father died when he was 19. His father's name was Mutt. Yeah, and he died when he was 19. Right, Mutt Man? Yeah. 19. And we, he said, you know, every time, you know, every time I'd uh, do something good on the field, I'd look out there, and he's not there. And I, I felt I failed him. You know, I felt like I failed him. And I said, Mickey, yeah. I lost my dad when I was 15. And I'm not you, but he set me on my way in what I do. And I know the feeling of doing a good show... And, and looking out and the chair's empty, there's no one there, or a wedding, yeah. no one's there, you know. So basically, this hero and I were basically two teenagers just missing their dads. And, and it was a phenomenal moment that I had with Mickey Mantle that's, that's not on a ball field, that's, uh, it was just two guys talking. And what was it about him? Was it the power, because we love the home run and he could hit him, and he was stronger and he could hit from both sides of the plate and he could run faster he had this gifts but he had this charisma too yeah and it was the 50s you know he was very much a a, a, a prince of the 50s you know he was elvis in pinstripes yeah and he was so you know it was all of it the blonde hair the blue eye the yeah. the perfect physique he looked better in a uniform than anybody else but it was the unpredictable power that you would see something spectacular yeah. and he also was fragile and, you know, it was like it was like hoping he'd get through a game sometimes because he was always breaking down in, in, in some way. And it was very akin to Ali. When Ali was, was, was our champion, no one hit him, you know. And when he started to slow down just a little bit, now he's mm-hmm. getting hit and he's getting mm-hmm. cut by Henry Cooper. And, he's, mm-hmm. and, and, he, and you'd go, he got hit, mm-hmm. you know. And when Mantle would... It just was so spectacular, a player that you just want, he got through the game okay. He got through it okay. And he was so, he was just so interesting on a ball field. It's very hard to to put into words, but I've been with him uh, when grown men would cry when they'd see him. He meant that much to us. And, you know, other critics of of, of those of us who love men will say, what, I don't understand it. Well, they didn't live through it. And, you know, people like Bob Costas, yeah, Bob really Bob did. I think Bob gave it. a eulogy at his And Bob and service. I wrote that together. Yeah. Oh, um, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and it was beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, Bob and I called him 
to come to Dallas, and we did not know that he was terminal. Mm. And Mickey um, said, listen, I want to be stronger when I see you, and then we can have some fun. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys now that I'm sober. And he knew that he was dying. Yeah. So when it was, when it was all done, Bob called me, and I went to Dallas. And the night before the funeral, we stayed up like two high school kids cramming for a final. But, and we, we, we hugged each other like we were there to, to bury a, a very loved relative. But what we really were burying was our childhood. Yeah. You have a remarkable quality for friendship. I'm fortunate I have great friends. Yeah. Uh, the Oscars, too, is in here. How many times? Eight? Nine. Nine. Um, <clears throat> why were you... What was it about you and the Oscars? I mean, you did it, and, and this is a hard thing. We've seen a lot of people do it okay, but you did it with a certain... Uh, I tried the proof to make is it in special. the pudding. They wanted you to come back every year. Yeah, I, t I tried to make it special. I tried to make it different. I tried to change the, uh, the job of what the host did. And and we did. We did a lot of different things. We did the the musical medley of the, oh, the nominated yeah, songs. We then started doing the uh, putting me in the nominated films. Yes. And uh, we did things throughout the body of the show. I know what they're thinking, and we shot people in the audience, and I would you know improvise what I thought they were thinking, and we just tried to make it fresh and different. And and I had some of my best moments as a comedian on the on the Oscar stage. It, when you when you look at this and you look at all the things you do, that's pretty high up. It's very high up. But yeah. the highest yeah. thing. Would have to be batting leadoff for the New York Yankees. <laughs> it, it's, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, besides my wife, my kids, my grandkids, I led off for the New York Yankees. Won it bad. And, and what happened? I struck out, but yes, of course I you fouled did. one off. Yeah, that's, you, you got the wood on the. I got, I got wood on a major league yeah. fastball by yeah. Paul Mahalam of the Pittsburgh Pirates. It was the night. This is this is it. I mean, if you could have played for the Yankees, nothing else would have mattered. No, I, I would have. I'd be in broadcasting. Now. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'd be would. sitting with David Cohn and Michael Kay. <laughs> He's That's not going right. to his left the way he should. <laughs> That's right. Uh, it's a wonderful book. Uh, it Thank really you. is. And I want to close because your wife is there. Uh, 43 years, huh? Yes. And you talk about, I mean, what's interesting about this, you talk about dying. You talk about, you know, what happens when you get 65. Uh, and and you just talk about what, what's meant something to you. So you learn Jack Rollins' advice well, that what people care about is who you are. And, you know, and, and what you, who, you know, it's the personal things that people remember, mm -hmm. you know, and that's it in here. One story from another. It's called Still Fooling Them, Where I've Been, Where I'm Going, and Where the Hell Are My Keys. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Thank Great you. Great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.